Okay, uh, good morning friends, uh, uh, as we announced on the ISY Implant Study Forum, uh, in this fourth Corona vacation, uh, I am Paresh Kale, uh, going live uh, with uh, my presentation on digital uh, dentistry. Uh, since we are all cooped up in our homes uh, and you know our own places uh, i really don't have much uh, backup here to help me um, uh, if there is any technical glitch so if there's any problem please uh, give me a call so i can i can uh, try and fix those uh, since i have to do everything by myself uh, things are very different till very recent uh, these are pictures of my daughters uh, from many years ago and now things changed really really very fast and we are our generation is a witness of how fast things can change uh, for this presentation i have a few uh, uh, disclaimers uh, that all these cases are mine uh, unless mentioned otherwise uh, i do speak uh, on different company uh, forums and uh, for the moment uh, this is uh, without any commercial service transactions i have no conflict of interest uh, to declare this is uh, these are pictures of my office uh, and uh, uh, that's where i'm speaking to you from uh, a brief, brief introduction about myself i'm a prosthodontist uh, practicing in pune practice limited to uh, prosthetics and restorative dentistry and implantology of course uh, I was the first one to become a uh, diplomat of uh, ABOI, which is probably the highest uh, implantology body in the world. I encourage everybody to take uh, their exam. Uh, that is something that will qualify you as an implant specialist uh, once you uh, pass the diplomat exam. This was a couple of years ago, and uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's something that you must keep on your horizons at the, at the right time. Uh, take this up when you when you seem when it seems right for you. Uh, ours is a practice uh, which is uh, fifty seven years old. Uh, I joined my father uh, in his practice in nineteen ninety one, uh, and that puts a lot of shall we say responsibility. I have inherited patients from my father who are in practice for the last fifty seven years now actually. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, uh, weight on me. There are different places you go to, to seek, uh, I'm going to make one small change. The reason being my, the screen where I am seen is a little too big uh, and that's kind of cramming up uh, the space. Okay, so that should, that should work well now. So uh, there are different places we go to, to get, uh, to get uh, uh, knowledge, to get information. So there are resources uh, for learning and for religious things and for for conceptual things we go we uh, rely on the holy books. Uh, of course, there are uh, other things like uh, dummies and cookbooks, uh, which uh, tend to give us uh, things which are either ready to use kind of format. In today's world, uh, there is so much of following, trending, discovering, and posting going on. Uh, I must confess that I'm not much of a social media fellow, but in these uh, peculiar times, I guess I have no choice but to resort uh, to them to communicate with uh, my colleague friends. Uh, there is this Google God, which uh, gives us a lot of information. It gives us some by means of some literature that's available online. Uh, but how about wisdom? Does it really teach you uh, the right, uh, shall we, things. It's our choices that show what we truly are, uh, far more than our ability. We may be great clinicians, but the choices we make uh, that really defines us, says J.K. Rowling. We are physicians of oral cavity and not technicians uh, who work inside the mouth. And we need to be aware of this, we need to be responsible about it, and we need to make the right choices uh, accordingly. I'm going to speak about digital dentistry how it can widen uh, horizons. It certainly has done to me. 
Uh, the agenda for today, for today is introduction, digital technologies, uh, the data and workflows. Uh, how are these applied in fixed prosthodontics? Uh, uh, some things about a little bit about smile design. Uh, some about implant industry, past, present, and future. What it can do to digital with digital technologies, and how that can uh, you know change the way we do things and make some things very very easy. I was introduced to uh, digital technologies, uh, the, the clinical applications, particularly uh, scanning in a very peculiar manner. Uh, this was on patient who walks into my office, uh, terminal dentition, grade three mobility, most of the teeth. The anteriors were so mobile that I, uh, that they could fall any moment. They were so mobile that I was scared of making an impression as well. Around the same time was one scan uh, company, which was uh, coaxing me to give it a try. So I thought this was the best place to begin my journey. So I had the guys uh, come up. This was one patient who said, I will not go without teeth. Uh, went through some investigations and you can see uh, uh, on the right uh, little picture, how little or none, no bone that supported these. Most of these tissues were virtually supported in soft tissue only. Making an attempt uh, to make an impression with uh, alginate would have meant some teeth lost at that time and I would not have possibly fixed those. So I had this uh, loan, uh, scanner on loan available. Uh, I got my inputs. Uh, we, I could get an STL model uh, from the scanner, uh, which was uh, a 3D printed uh, model. Now using this model, uh, the maxillary and mandibular both, uh, we mounted these, uh, duplicated those and made this patient a complete uh, removal maxillary and mandibular dentures. I wonder how this could have been possible without uh, being able to scan this patient uh, intraorally uh, and satisfy her needs uh, as far as uh, giving her teeth immediately uh, were concerned. Uh, we of course uh, extracted the maxillary placed implants in the mandibular at the same time and uh, rehabilitated this patient with a fixed uh, uh, restoration for the mandibular arch with a hybrid prosthesis and a complete uh, removal uh, denture for the maxillary arch. Uh, I'm going to take a break now. I'm just going to switch my phones off so that we are not, we are no interruption. Sorry about that. Uh, the problem of being alone uh, in uh, at this time. Uh, so the hybrid prosthesis and removal complete max um, uh, denture. Uh, resolved this patient's uh, concern completely. Extremely happy patient. The other case uh, we tried at the same time was I had prepped a maxillary mandibular molar for a crown and a scan uh, allowed me to send this uh, digital file to the laboratory. In a few days in a, bo in a box I got a crown made. Uh, so placed that in and honestly to describe you what the feeling was surreal. Uh, I'm used to seeing models. I'm used to checking fits on them and without any such to have a crown that fits uh, uh, on, on the prep uh, perfectly with excellent margins, with perfect occlusion was indeed a surreal, uh, surreal uh, uh, feeling. You know, it almost felt like a story out of a, uh, out of a ghost story. So this is how uh, I, I got introduced to uh, some prosthetic, uh, shall we say, applications of uh, three-shaped triers uh, and impressions made uh, for 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 uh, prosthetic needs. You know, conventional impressions. Uh, this comes from American Dental Association. Uh, that conventional impressions are barely accurate. Uh, when examined critically, only seven percent are accurate. Thirteen percent are acceptable. Uh, so 80 percent need to be repeated, uh, of which uh, majority of them are fixed by the lab, uh, unfortunately. But that's the way reality is. That's the way life is. Compared to that, digital impressions or scans are faster. They're precise. There are no retakes. There's no impression material required. Uh, there's no transportation required. You don't need a delivery person or a courier to take them to the lab and bring them back. And it really opens a world of new opportunities. And we're going to look at some of uh, those. Before that, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what this digital dentistry involves. 
We basically capture digital data, data captured in a digital format with intraoral, extraoral scanners, uh, with CBCD scans, uh, with maybe face scans, which are yet to come. Uh, that data is used to uh, uh, employ in digital workflows. For example, uh, you can uh, scan a patient, make an impression after crown and bridge preps, and crown and bridges can be made. These can be used to uh, make guides for implants. We can make virtual treatment pl implant planning and manufacture guides and restorations to be able to place our implants and restorations on top. In orthodontics, uh, one can make aligners uh, by virtual uh, tooth movement and uh, making uh, uh, transparent uh, uh, suck downs which uh, fit uh, with, the, with the slight misfit, uh, which is what the Invisalign was, uh, you know, popularized the technology as. We can also take this further and use that for patient communication in smile design, treatment simulation, and maintenance over a period of time as to how dental arches or tissues or bone changes. With conventional dentistry, we are used to having a certain set of input data. We make models, we make impressions, we have uh, radiographs. Uh, we use different processes to use this input data. For example, we may work on the models, wax them up, we may duplicate dentures, we may uh, set teeth, uh, we may make prep abutments, we may make surgical guides by modifying uh, dentures or uh, fabricate them. So these are the processes that we may use. And we can use, uh, we can uh, get our outputs by processing acrylic, uh, metals, uh, porcelains, uh, and a combination of those, like for example, the one that you see at the bottom, where which is a hybrid prosthesis metal framework on which teeth are processed. Things have changed over the last uh, several decades. Uh, the analog uh, world has changed into digital world and it has entered almost every aspect of our life. And the reason for that has been the processors and their speed, which has changed exponentially. Uh, also, the storage is the sto amount, amount of data that we can store has, uh, has, has increased significantly. Uh, 126 GB uh, uh, flash card, which is a micro SD card, which literally is uh, the size of your thumbnail. Uh, the same about uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, required uh, you know a large box to contain that data so that's how much the amount of storage that has changed besides exponential increase in the processor speed that we have so with this change we can uh, we, we do things a little differently uh, we have input method which is different uh, the processes are a little different and the output can it would be certainly significantly different and we'll look look at these uh, attributes so one by one. The input data can be by means of intraoral scanner. It can be by CBCD scans, or it can be by tabletop scanners, like uh, uh, like the one in like the one that you see here. These scanners uh, capture data uh, by using optical methods or uh, radiology, and one can virtual one can get uh, virtual 3D data uh, in an STL form or DCM for, format which can be uh, used for uh, our processing, unlike conventional where we use models, radiographs, and uh, physical impressions. The processes have changed significantly. Conventionally, we did wax ups and we set teeth and we modified abutments uh, by use of uh, trimmers. Uh, we packed acrylics, etc. Now we can uh, do virtual mountings. Uh, we can, uh, on an ortho studio, we can move teeth, uh, move teeth virtually. On an implant studio, we can uh, plan placement of implant after extraction, virtual extraction of teeth, uh, locate these implants in a, in a place that you want to and fabricate surgical guides. One can even fabricate uh, temporary restorations. In a dental studio kind of a thing, we can um, uh, design the restorations, uh, print them, mill them uh, stereolithographically or, or, or mill them on a, on, a, on a CNC machine. And these technologies, uh, which were largely used for industrial applications, have found their way into dentistry. The outputs by milling, by sintering, by, la by laser sintering, uh, and by 3D printing 
have really changed the way uh, we are able to uh, give uh, uh, service to our patients in, a, in an extremely significant manner. These have opened uh, new treatment, uh, new possibilities and new uh, treatment uh, uh, protocols and opportunities. And I'm going to share a couple of them with you before we go on to uh, 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 the smile design and implant uh, planning and implant placement. Uh, typical phases in a full mouth uh, rehabilitation include diagnosis and planning. You, you examine the patient, you make uh, photos, you make journals and record, you model uh, the models that you make of the patient, you mount them, you wax them up. And this becomes a starting point for our treatment, for, for treatment communication and treatment execution. We use uh, these as a beginning, as a start for the preps uh, that we do uh, intraorally. Uh, fortunately, that's one thing that has not changed uh, as yet and not likely to change the near, in the near future. We are still going to need to make these preps and um, um, make some records, maybe digitally. So after these preps are made uh, in, a, in, a, in a conventional uh, method of treatment, we would make impressions, we would make jar record, uh, and we would make temporaries. We would work on these temporaries, uh, perfect them. And uh, so that we can then copy these into the final restoration where the lab starts working on them and delivers us uh, this uh, full mouth uh, fabric, fa fa fabricate these uh, crowns, bridges, uh, for us to be able to deliver this full mouth rehabilitation as you see on the right hand side of the screen. Digital technologies have changed the way we do certain things. This gentleman reports, uh, comes to me saying uh, he has extremely sensitive mandibular uh, teeth uh, uh, with a lot of wear on anteriors, posteriors, both. So the plan was to make, uh, to go through a, a full, mouth rehab, full mouth rehabilitation, treating the mandibular arch only. Much of, some of the maxillary arch was already uh, treated. So I take the input as a digital scan. Uh, we have uh, laboratory work on them and do a virtual wax up. Unlike actually adding wax on the model, uh, the lab added, added onto those teeth virtually. So this, we would call this as a virtual wax up. Now on, on this virtual wax up, uh, the laboratory prepped teeth. So they gave a command on the computer saying that we want an even reduction of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeters. So they got another, another uh, shall we say, uh, image which had the prep and the subtraction between this the external outline form of the virtual wax up and the preps which are again virtually done the subtraction of that uh, could be made into a digital file that file could be printed so we could get printed polymethyl methacrylate shells which I'm going to now use as temporary restorations uh, once the preps are done now the external contours came from the virtual wax up. The internal contours of these shells came from the minimal prep that laboratory did virtually. So these shells are just about 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters in thickness and uh, going into the clinical steps after the preparation of all the teeth were done, uh, these could fit fairly easily. So what, I'm, what I would do then is reline these with uh, polymethyl methacrylate which would bond to these uh, shells created extremely well. Uh, after the margins were finished and finalized, uh, I would go into the mouth and, f and equilibrate the occlusion. Now, unlike uh, in conventional, my process is actually going to begin now to collect digital records intraorally. Now, digital impressions for uh, prosthodontic uh, procedures allow you to make a pre-scan, that means scan of the unprepared or the external contour of the tooth. So I made a pre-scan of these finished temporaries as the external contour that is now acceptable as the contour that we would like in our final restorations. After removing these temporaries, I made a scan of the preps. So we have now scan of the preps and scan of the approved or finalized temporaries. The subtraction between them 
is going to be the space that the restorations are going to occupy. So these are some more images of uh, the temporary scan, which was the external contour scan and the prep scan, which is the tooth surface on which these restorations are going to be uh, fitted. Now, these 3D models can be, uh, you know, seen, examined in different angles, in different uh, manners. You can also see the amount of clearance that you have by a function that some of these softwares provide. So these are some of these um, images of uh, the pre and the post scan that I did for this patient. What the lab could do then was they had the external contour surface recorded. They had the tooth surface uh, recorded and the subtraction between that was the anatomy of the crowns. Uh, the laboratory's work was simplified. I was extremely sure about what I was getting back. The laboratory could uh, mill uh, uh, monolithic crowns which are stained. Some of these new monolithic, monolithic materials look extremely beautiful. So there's no layering on any of these uh, crowns. And this could be done in extremely easy steps with a few clicks for the lab as the lab process. All that the laboratory had to use was use the external contour of the temporaries and make it fit with individual uh, restoration on, you know, on the teeth prep that we had done. Uh, the design element for the, for the laboratory was virtually, you know, was extremely simplified, virtually eliminated. Uh, so uh, monolithic crowns, which are, which are stained, delivered in a matter of a few days. The lab process got simplified. The clinical process uh, made the communication extremely easy. So this was a very uh, efficient, effective lab communication. There's another benefit in doing things digitally. Uh, if, you, if you remember, the preps were extremely short. And the night guard that I made for this patient uh, had a contact only on the mandibular two incisors and that made one of the uh, crowns uh, get loose uh, in spite of the fact that it was cemented with a temporary cement because of the height of the prep. Uh, I changed that to have the anti the night guard uh, cover, cover or contact with more mandibular incisors. And all I had to do was ask the lab. You know, we did that case uh, sometime back, uh, the mandibular right incisor, the patient lost, uh, could you please make one? Uh, virtually in a few hours, uh, the lab could mill that and I had this crown ready to deliver, which, which we actually had lost, would have meant a long process, uh, in a matter of uh, uh, several hours. Uh, that's, the, that's the power and beauty of uh, digital technologies, that it's repeatable. It can be easily, some of the process can be done, uh, repeated extremely easily. So these are some of the views of uh, the uh, protrusive and excursive uh, movements and shows the occlusion as planned uh, in the virtual plan. So we have a happy, happy patient here with uh, simplified treatment protocol and uh, ease uh, with uh, lab uh, communication, just because uh, we could work digitally and extremely effectively. Uh, we can take this uh, a step further and employ this to a larger rehabilitation kind of a situation. This gentleman required lots of restoration, rehabilitation of uh, occlusion because there was a lot of uh, wear uh, of, of his teeth. Uh, I'm going to take one minute more once again to put my computer on a charger. My sincere apologies for going away to get my charger working. Uh, so this gentleman required uh, a full mouth rehabilitation uh, because of uh, significant wear, uh, uh, loss in vertical dimension of occlusion, and poor aesthetics on account of that. Uh, we employ a similar protocol uh, for uh, doing this full mouth uh, rehabilitation. So I take a um, simple uh, cardiac wax, uh, clinical, by clinical judgment, estimate the amount of vertical opening that I think I would need or I would be happy with for the amount of uh, thickness to my restoration. I make a scan with this as my bite. So what the laboratory gets is this. They have uh, teeth, which are, uh, which are a digital image, and the space in between them. And using the same process, uh, the laboratory would uh, then uh, do a 
uh, a virtual waxer. Uh, they, 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 they would print uh, a shell of temporary once again. So I go into uh, the preps, I prepare one arch on one day, uh, the mandible are going first. Uh, and as you can see, the shell fits fairly well. I needed a f I needed to make a few adjustments in some places where the shell was really too tight or would, or would not allow complete seating. A reline with polymethyl methacrylate allows allowed me to make uh, excellent temporaries uh, with very little effort. On day two, when I s uh, set out, uh, I prepped one side of the arch, including anteriors. I removed temporaries from one side of the mandible and recorded uh, the vertical dimension of occlusion in centric relation. Uh, so the record on the right hand side of uh, the job was one that I was going to use and complete at a later stage. I finished the prep in the maxillary arch uh, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen. So the, so the John Wilson record that I made first before all teeth were prepped uh, captured the vertical dimension of occlusion, captured the centric relation because the temporaries were adjust, adjusted to, to uh, those uh, the, the CR. Uh, with preps on one, one side and unprepped uh, uh, in the maxillary and temporaries on the right hand side. After the preps were completed, uh, uh, I, I would go ahead and make a jaw relation record for the other side, including uh, and, and the whole arch with a hard silicone bite resistation uh, material uh, as you see now on the right hand side of the screen. So now what we are going to provide the lab is a scan of two arches prepped and a jaw, a jaw relation record with the, the jaw relation record material separating these two arches at the vertical dimension of occlusion that we want to restore this case in in a centriculation record uh, in a centriculation position so that the laboratory now could start fabricating restorations like they did with the previous case uh, previous uh, case the job is extremely simple because the lab has the external contours internal contours and uh, as in the preps and at the right vertical dimension in the right center so this was uh, the situation where the maxillary temporaries were completed the the temporary scan became my pre-operative scan as far as the laboratory records were concerned. Uh, I also happened to make uh, uh, physical impressions, the conventional method, and there was a reason for that. Reason number one was that we were short on time. Uh, the patient was from overseas and things were on a limited time situation. The second reason was that the plan was to make uh, monolithic crowns for the uh, posteriors and layered zirconia for the anteriors for better aesthetics since all anteriors, maxillary and mandibular both were uh, involved. So the physical impression and jaw relation record was a backup and as a support for the laboratory to uh, do the layering once the uh, digital manufacturing process was complete with uh, cutbacks on the uh, anteriors for the layering material. So the plan then was uh, to make uh, three to three crowns, uh, separate of course, uh, with layering porcelain and the posteriors by translucent aesthetic monolithic zirconia crowns. It was a matter of again a few days before the lab could make because their process was extremely simple. And then we could try these crowns in for uh, the virtues that we wanted to. And I figured out using a Teflon uh, instead of a cement uh, allowed me to retain these crowns otherwise that can be uh, a little difficult. And once I had confirmed that these these crowns had a had a good fit and uh, the occlusion was acceptable, I could cement these. So in a matter of a few days, a full mouth rehabilitation could be completed with uh, with with uh, with a plan that was uh, uh, based on you know vertical dimension, centriculation, uh, as 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 we had expected. So. With these few cases, uh, you could see that uh, you know there's a lot of simplicity brought into uh, our, our treatment protocols, our treatment uh, uh, sequences. Uh, they would make your treatment efficient and time saving. Uh, the reproducibility would be fantastic because uh, there is no uh, building up uh, all over again kind of a kind of a process for the lab and for the clinical uh, situation as well. 
uh, it can be cost effective. It could save time, uh, and it would definitely uh, reduce the risk of some errors that may occur because of uh, you know manual handling of materials and uh, instruments and techniques. Uh, you know mounting mounting models uh, on, a, on an articulator, adjusting the articulator, things like that. The outcomes would definitely be far more predictable, and they would make uh, the process uh, less dependent on the skill of the operator uh, without taking emphasis on the required skill as we of course uh, know. Let's uh, take uh, this uh, one step further and look at the other application of what digital dentistry can do. Uh, smile uh, design is one uh, application that many of our patients desire. They would like their anteriors to uh, start looking better. Uh, they would like smile design is a very popular, um, shall we say, element in our practices today. So this girl uh, was getting married, wanted her anteriors uh, fixed. So we could take a few pictures and put them in uh, the virtual planning software. And what you see on the right hand side was the same picture on the left hand side with anteriors uh, from a template uh, replacing or overlaying uh, the patient's original teeth. Now this becomes a great uh, uh, mode to communicate and to plan uh, our procedures. Uh, we are very familiar with uh, DSD, the Digital uh, Dental uh, uh, Studio. And uh, this is uh, on the same lines as that. Of course, DSD allows you to do far more things. But I'm sure many of these or most of these systems which allow only smile design virtually right now would eventually end up uh, having these possibilities of uh, creating STLs of the, of the wax up and then eventually helping us with prep and designing our, uh, designing our restorations. So uh, what we communicated by design, we could do a mock-up inside the mouth. Uh, that seemed uh, acceptable and we used that as a reference for making, for designing our definitive restorations. So we go through uh, the step of preps, uh, veneers uh, from three to three, temporization on the day of the preps and preps uh, in Emacs uh, pressed, uh, delivered to this patient in a, in a few days uh, time. So uh, uh, a virtual uh, smile design and uh, manufacturing or, or processing by the conventional method allows us to marry uh, the old with the new with uh, far more efficiency and far more predictability. Uh, predictability. So that's a finished picture of uh, the anterior smile design case with veneers on uh, three to three for a patient who's happy, uh, is about to get married, started looking beautiful. Let's change uh, some gears now uh, and go on to some implantology. We are on the Indian Society of Implantology uh, Forum and I can't do without uh, talking about implants. Uh, that's one picture some of you may have seen uh, because that's a, almost some that's almost a picture that I like to invoke uh, the talks on implants because this is a great success story uh, from uh, from my practice. Uh, this was my very second case. Uh, it's uh, more than 25 years uh, old now. Uh, as a matter of fact, 27 years old now. This picture, this X-ray comes from 25 years ago. If you have to comment about the implant, the design, uh, the features, there's probably everything that's not right about uh, this design or this implant. A titanium plasma sprayed implant, which was a press fit with no anti-hex, uh, with no anti-rotational element, uh, where we could make only uh, cement retained restorations, was actually a very poor uh, way to, uh, to employ uh, implants. Uh, but uh, look at the success. After 25 years in service, we still have uh, fantastic bone levels and it still looks uh, great. Uh, this is uh, what reinforces my belief in uh, this field and science of implant dentistry. That's another case from 15 years of post-operative. Again, there is something, there's some to critique about these implants. These implants are external hex connection. Uh, people are very critical about uh, about connections and these connections are considered to be a poor connection from the point of view of aesthetics and bone maintenance but look at look at the x-ray 15 years post-operative and look at the tissues fantastically maintained 
So we know a lot of things in dentistry that we do actually work. Uh, and there are, in our libraries of our, our patients, we would find an umpteen number of cases, virtually, uh, you know, most, which work extremely well. That's a five-year follow-up of a case with a lot of anterior bone augmentation by GBR and two separate crowns. Uh, these are, again, very long-term follow-ups of, you know, of uh, a couple of old injuries. Uh, that's a follow-up of a hybrid prosthesis, uh, a gentleman who wanted fixed restoration to be able to have uh, right function, opposed by a maxillary complete denture. And that's a long-term follow-up of a fixed full arch uh, rehabilitation with uh, cement and screw uh, combination, uh, retained uh, restorations to rehab rehabilitate the maxillary and mandibular both arches. This is at about eight years of follow-up. However, not everything we do uh, works uh, as well as some things which have been established. Uh, we do come across uh, certain situations like this, and this was, in my, in my opinion, an experimental material used as a definitive restoration. This was a peak uh, 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 full arch uh, restoration, touted to have lots of uh, benefits. But look at how it works. So without evidence, without without having had long term, shall we say, trials and, and established success, I think uh, there is a reason to believe that we need to be cautious with what we do and the choices that we make, because all that we are promised uh, may not necessarily be met. So we know things work. Uh, like with the one on the on the left hand side is again a seven or eight years old post operative uh, and the one on the right hand side uh, has not worked for a lot of reasons some of these reasons would become extremely evident uh, with the radiographs overlaid now implants too large prosthetic procedures done extremely poorly extraction and, and immediate insertion implants is inserted too deep uh, these are the reasons for the pictures on the right hand side not to work well uh, as against uh, the right size of implants, uh, the right uh, location at place at the right depth with the right kind of material is the reason why the, the, the case on the left hand side has worked. And we understand by now why things work and why they don't work. And to put them in a brief uh, summary in a couple of slides. I could summarize that we need adequate bone dimensions for implants and uh, the restorations on, on them to uh, work, to last and stay uh, unaltered over a long period of time. We need to have implants placed in a proper three-dimensional location. We understand that we need the right uh, tissue thickness. Uh, we want to have the right implant and abutment design with the right features. We need prosthetic uh, uh, designs which are uh, biologic and we use, need to use the right kind of prosthetic materials that have been proven. Everything old is not necessarily bad. Everything, is, everything that is new is not necessarily good. Uh, and we know that our treatment needs to be based on some prosthetic principles. We need to uh, understand what is the desired prosthesis that we want to treat this patient with. And that becomes the starting point for us to use uh, that information or that uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a guideline to execute our prosthesis. So we end up with the right implants in the right place uh, with the right kind of restorations on top when we use uh, these elements uh, in our treatment plan, which is necessarily a process. So for which purpose we may use uh, study models, wax ups and work ups. We may do mock surgeries on models and we can use, make surgical guides. We make temporaries uh, to, uh, shall we say, have the right aesthetic uh, properties to be able to communicate uh, uh, what we have, uh, what we want to perform with the definitive restoration with the laboratory. We may make indices of those and we would of course uh, do trials of uh, our, our fabricated prosthesis. Now these are fundamentals in implant dentistry uh, and prosthetic dentistry in general uh, right now. And these are not changing, these are not going away. When you follow these fundamentals, we understand why things work. And when you don't follow these fundamentals, uh, that's why things uh, don't necessarily work. Uh, there's this very interesting book uh, by James Clear, 
says without fundamentals the details are useless with fundamentals tiny gains can add up to something significant i think that's an extremely uh, profound uh, statement so uh, we tend to focus too much on details uh, but we should not lose sight of uh, fundamentals so uh, to be able to add these tiny gains in the in the past we would uh, do different kinds of things and over the next few slides and a couple of cases i'll demonstrate that and then compare that to see how things have changed so in the past we would duplicate a patient's prosthesis uh, we could make uh, we could invest that in uh, alginet so that the prosthesis could come out easily and then we could make uh, duplicate dentures in uh, clear acrylic and with ready opaque teeth which we could use to uh, shall we say make a surgical guide or a, or a, or a, or, a, or a projection of a surgical guide so duplicate dentures with ready opaque teeth uh, could allow us to see where the teeth location is with respect to the bone that we uh, that we have to be able to place implant our project requires implants placed in location that prosthesis uh, commands and our project of implantology does not depend on where bone is is where you place implants so you want to place implants in prosthetically driven position uh, locations so one can use the same uh, radiographic template now which has got converted as a surgical guide to mark the osteotomies uh, and then uh, place our implants in the right location uh, to be able to execute this uh, case uh, to a definitive prosthesis like you see with these several pictures uh, a prosthetically driven uh, design a prosthetically driven uh, so implant placement so that you have the right elements that go into um, into the case another case which illustrates demon demonstrated this uh, uh, even further so with a duplicate denture uh, and in the bottom row you see radio opaque teeth with respect to the amount with, with respect to the bone uh, that's uh, available now that allows us to place implants in the right location and the plan here is to be able to place uh, implants uh, uh, in locations such that we can make three separate bridges so our implants are placed uh, i'm going to use the these duplicate dentures now to be able to uh, by, uh, by hollowing them out to be able to make a final impression so impression posts go in as you see on the right hand side the uh, uh, impression uh, copings do not interfere with uh, the duplicate denture which has got hollowed out uh, we would splint these uh, in the in uh, uh, to have more accuracy to our impression uh, and then would make an impression of these impression copings uh, into these duplicate dentures. Now the purpose behind uh, making impressions in duplicate dentures is several fold. It allows us to make a jaw relation record at the same time, like you see on the right pictures. And then that also allows the laboratory to understand where the teeth are located. So when you have a jaw relation record, uh, and an impression made in duplicate dentures, the laboratory has all the necessary element that it needs. It has uh, the vertical dimension of occlusion, it has the uh, central relation record, and location of teeth that came from previous uh, dentures, so the laboratory could now place uh, teeth for the maxillary complete denture, and design the restorations for the mandibular arch, which are going to be three separate uh, bridges, without doing any guesswork that also eliminates a lot of steps of making temporary bases doing your recent record in wax and then setting teeth uh, in wax and then going through a trial this already was a trial denture duplicate denture worked like a trial denture centrication record could be recorded in them so we could significantly save on a lot of steps to be able to uh, uh, to be able to uh, make this treatment sequence make this treatment protocol more effective so so on the third appointment i had uh, on the second appointment rather i had the metal trine for the framework uh, ready and i had a maxillary uh, trine ready on the third appointment i could deliver this patient the definitive restorations a maxillary complete denture and mandibular fixed prosthesis so 
we could use duplicate dentures for uh, to use as uh, radiographic stents to use as surgical guide and also make the laboratory communication extremely effective shorten the amount of treatment time shorten the number of patients visits and chair side time to make things more effective i like this early iron man only progressed after he started cutting corners cutting corners making things short does not necessarily mean uh, does not have to mean that we need to compromise on the output that we have or effect that we have we live in this world of fourth industrial revolution uh, the first one was with steam with mechanical uh, then was electricity computers brought a big change in the last century uh, and that has led us to the fourth industrial revolution which uh, which uh, uh, allows us to do things with you know more technology and more information taking this to implantology we can employ this uh, by being able to plan things much better being able to uh, load our implants sooner by having restorations that are prefabricated this was a case uh, we did live uh, uh, about a year ago uh, which was of a guided uh, implant surgery so a simple case with two teeth missing shows the whole protocol and that's the reason for including this in the presentation so teeth where teeth were missing uh, virtual teeth were placed one maxillary molar and one premolar uh the intraoral scan or the scan of the model was merged with a cbcd scan and that allows us to see uh the location of teeth with respect to the uh, anatomic structures and the available bone so then one could place virtual implants in this uh, software uh both implants and you see the guide uh, you see the access holes now for them the access of the implant with respect to the anatomic location like the maxillary sinus in this uh, situation so this is a virtual planning for the maxillary uh, right uh, second premolar and that's a virtual plan for the maxillary uh, left molar anatomic structure we're going to try and avoid we could easily uh, place a 9 mm implant in the site and then uh, after approval of these uh, the location of these implants uh, their three dimensional uh, orientation uh, one could uh, design a guide so this shows a model with uh, the virtual uh, implant uh, location sites and then one could uh, <clears throat> design a surgical guide that goes uh, to be able to place this implant in these locations these softwares would also allow you to uh, use a specific uh, surgical uh, guided surgery kit in this case we happen to use a bioran kit uh, the uh, the the uh, the software would also give you a drilling protocol it will also give you a surgical report and would allow you to complete uh, this case in a very convenient manner uh, uh, possibly by going um, by a lapless uh, surgical procedure let's look at a real case uh, where uh, i could uh, do a guide planning uh, fabrication of temporary restoration and immediate load so let's start with a simple case uh, four mandibular anteriors are doomed for an extraction uh, for a patient who has had lots of rehabilitation done in the past uh, so implants are not unfamiliar to him uh, we are going to use this uh, new technology now and the patient goes through a cbct scan the cbct scan is going to uh, allow us to uh, understand where uh, adequate bone is to be able to place implant in a prosthetic orientation some pre pre operative records like pictures and a 3d scan of this uh, patient uh, using this 3d scan uh, of this patient and and the and the cbct scan uh, we are now going to place uh, virtually implants in this uh, mandibular anterior region after virtual extraction of these teeth these steps are well defined uh, that you start with a with a plan uh, you make a prescription uh, you import the CBCT scan into this uh, the, the, into this uh, art scan. 
uh, you merge these uh, scans together uh, you can uh, you can uh, virtually extract these teeth and you will see that with uh, with the next uh, case place implants uh, in in the appropriate uh, location with the right bone dimensions uh, uh, with the right amount of distance between teeth and uh, facial and lingual cortical plates and in between two implants uh, with implant access uh, going through the right uh, area which is uh, through the cingulum or fossa uh, on, the, on the lingual side. We could then manufacture a guide for uh, this patient and this is done by a 3D printing uh, and that allows us to see uh, or use this for to be able to uh, do a surgery uh, with a surgical uh, with, a, with a guided surgery kit. So these are some of the pictures of the virtual plan and allows us to see the location of these implants with respect to the uh, implant location and access. So uh, the surgical guide is uh, then uh, made into an STL file uh, that's saved and then that exported to the laboratory to be able to print. Going into the clinical, uh, we would extract, uh, curate the socket. Uh, I would use a bioresonance guided surgery kit, uh, which consists of spoons and drills of different depths. The uh, surgical plan instructs me what size drills and what spoons to use uh, for each uh, location. So there are specific spoons to be used uh, with specific drills. Uh, of specific lengths and these come in different uh, diameters. So going into the surgery after the teeth were extracted, the guide is uh, located onto the teeth with uh, the use of uh, the right side spoons, uh, right sized uh, spoon. Uh, I am able to make osteotomies in the most accurate uh, method format. Uh, after the virtual extraction of teeth, uh, one could also design restoration and these designed restorations can also be printed like you see uh, in these pictures. Uh, these can be kept ready for delivery on the day of uh, the surgery. So after the implants are placed, uh, a temporary restoration is then delivered uh, as you see on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, 48 hours post operatively is the way you see this. This heals, uh, the soft tissues heal and because we could place implants at the, at the right location of the right length, uh, we could now go ahead at uh, about six weeks post-operatively, an early loading kind of a protocol, uh, go ahead and scan this patient for a definitive restoration. So these are some of the prosthetic steps and I'm not going to really dwell on the prosthetic uh, aspects of uh, digital implant uh, dentistry much. Uh, so these are some of the prosthetic steps, uh, scan preoperatively and then scan of the scan bodies, which allows our laboratory to have uh, complete information on where these implants are located uh, accurately so that the laboratory then could design uh, restoration uh, virtually uh, and then uh, like in uh, these pictures, uh, the laboratory could design the restorations virtually and then on uh, within a few days these restorations are ready. On the day of the delivery, uh, I have this screw retained uh, layered zirconia bridge which is uh, bonded to titanium hybrid bases uh, delivered uh, in a few days uh, time after extraction of uh, rather uh, uh, placement of these implants making impressions. <clears throat> let's move on. Let's look at another case uh, and this is a little interesting because uh, we have a little bit of a situation with uh, patient's teeth which are going to get lost. The plan is, uh, this is a large rehabilitation and I'm going to show you a part of this uh, case uh, with respect to the anteriors. Uh, this is a lateral incisor which got modified to look like a central incisor. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, lost a lot of bone. The canine next to it is uh, fractured and uh, the plan is to extract both these teeth. This patient has already been treated for the posteriors with uh, maxillary sinus grafts uh, in, on one side with simultaneous implant placement, on the other side with uh, delayed implant placement. So the plan is to extract uh, the lateral, and, uh, lateral incisor and canine. 
lateral incisor which is in place of central and the canine uh, and to retain the first premolar which, which is restorable uh, because uh, the location of uh, lateral incisor is in a the root of the lateral incisor is in a peculiar place uh, placement of implant is going to need some thought is going to need some planning uh, there is a large incisive foramen which is going to limit us placement of implant closer to the uh, left central incisor. Uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the posteriors are already treated with uh, direct sinus lift uh, with simultaneous placement of implant on the uh, right hand side. So the plan is to place uh, two implants for the three missing, then missing maxillary anteriors and three implants for the posteriors. Uh, along with simultaneous placement of implant. So I go through a digital, shall we say, protocol, digital uh, workflow, uh, a preoperative scan uh, of the maxillary and mandibular arch in occlusion, and then implant planning, virtual implant planning. Now, as you can notice, uh, we can we have extracted virtually uh, the maxillary anteriors which were remaining, uh, and virtually placed now three uh, uh, three unit uh, uh, restoration. Now this is going to do two things. One is it's going to allow us to print this temporary restoration that can be delivered at an appropriate time if uh, the situation allows place it immediately uh, upon placement of implant. But it also is going to allow us to, uh, to uh, virtually see where our implants are located with respect to the teeth which we are going to replace. So we merge the CVCD scan with uh, the intraoral scan uh, as you see with uh, these pictures uh, and then uh, uh, and th th these steps are uh, specific to the system or to the software that you're that you're using some softwares may look like this some softwares may look uh, a little different but conceptually the steps are necessarily on the same lines so after the merger of uh, the CBCD scan with the intraoral scan. Uh, I, I have now virtually placed implants uh, into this uh, case and uh, confirm that they are where we want them. Uh, we are now going to go ahead one step. As you notice, uh, we are also making a surgical guide to be able to place implants for the posteriors and we are going to execute a maxillary sinus uh, lift first before placement of these implants. So uh, a surgical guide design uh, that shows us uh, implants uh, with respect to the adjacent teeth, with respect to the bone as you saw on the CBSD scan, and that's an STL file of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the surgical guide that we have ready uh, to place our implants. So on the day of the surgery, uh, the teeth that are going to be extracted are, are, are removed, uh, examine, the so examine the socket, uh, uh, curate the socket free from any, any uh, granulation tissue and now we have the surgical guide which we are going to place uh, using the guided surgery uh, kit. As you can notice uh, different spoons uh, go in with different uh, drills and that allows us to uh, place implants through the surgical guide. Now you would need to place implants through the surgical guide when you are interested in making sure that implants are placed exactly as they were planned uh, in the virtual plan. Uh, this would be mandatory, necessary if you're going to load this case immediately with the restorations which have been uh, pre-made. So as you can notice into these sockets, uh, we have these two implants placed not with respect to or not not uh, primarily focused on where the bone available is but uh, but focused on where the bone is available and where the teeth are going to going to need to be placed uh, if i was to do this case freehand i'm sure i would not have uh, i would have had challenges in being able to place these implants in this kind of a prosthetic prosthetically oriented uh, uh, location now, uh, there are different ways to manage uh, uh, the spaces around implants and the socket. Uh, so I use a mineralized allograft like you see in this case, 
and you see pictures of this case with surgical insertion of implants in the anterior uh, into extraction sockets and into a maxillary sinus lift with a mineralized allograft uh, added after a direct, direct sinus lift was performed uh, for, for this uh, uh, case. What, uh, uh, what, what I found uh, that was, uh, that was uh, really impressive uh, was uh, the way we could locate implants in the most accurate uh, location. Let's look at uh, one more case and then we'll probably change our gears and go on to something else. We, are all, we, are, we already are at about one hour, so maybe this could uh, finish in half an hour or so, and then we could have some time left for uh, some question answer and some discussion. So we have uh, this lady who comes in with uh, failing dentition, failing previous rehabilitation, and wants a significant uh, change in uh, uh, the way it appears, her teeth appear as well. So we go through again on the same lines, uh, 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 the necessary record collection. Uh, with clinical examination and the records, uh, we have a treatment plan already made. We know which teeth we are going to extract uh, and we know which teeth we are going to keep. Uh, I am a fairly conservative, uh, shall we say, I, fairly, I have a fairly conservative approach and I'm not one who's going to recommend such patients with extraction of all teeth and placement of maybe all on four or all on five or whatever be it. I still find value in keeping uh, several teeth which have a reasonable prognosis. There is literature available which, so, which shows that uh, you should hang on to teeth as long as you can and just making, extracting more teeth and simplifying uh, treatment procedures is not really the wisest uh, thing to do though it may seem simple or quick uh, at, at the beginning. Teeth restored, well restored teeth have the same prognosis as a freshly placed implant is what literature uh, shows with adequate number of studies. So we start with an intraoral scan, uh, then go on to a plan for virtual placement of implant. Uh, the plan has a prescription about which teeth are going to extract, and which teeth we are going to keep. So now we are going to uh, virtually, from, from the plan, we are going to go to the next step, where we are virtually going to extract the teeth that we, that we, are, that we are going to replace. So this is, a, this is one step where you can, you can uh, design the area where uh, the teeth which are going to be extracted are virtually eliminated from, from the 3D scan. You have a template of uh, teeth which are ready because you already in the plan uh, designed a restoration, a fixed uh, PMMA restoration to be fabricated for this uh, case. Once uh, the teeth are extracted, uh, there's a virtual plan and uh, fabrication of surgical guide and then a temporary uh, fixed uh, restoration. So these virtual temporaries are ready they are placed over the location and then you can always tweak, change their size, wax them up a little more, change their dimensions, uh, orientation of these teeth individually. You can virtually uh, design these the way you would like uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on, on the temporaries. You would of course marry the virtual scan, uh, the CBCT scan with uh, the intraoral scan and you would align. You would align such that uh, the intraoral scan matches as perfectly as possible with uh, indicated by green as possible with uh, the uh, CBCD scan. Now that brings in accuracy. Now with uh, the, the 3D scan merged with uh, CBCD scan, we are going to go on to the next steps. Like for example, in this case with a nerve definition, you are able to locate uh, uh, mandibular nerve, mental foramen, and then we can plan location placement of implants in the appropriate location. Once these implants are planned to be placed in appropriate location, we are going to be able to manufacture, uh, we are going to be able to design the surgical guide. Uh, with the plan approved, the software would give us a drilling protocol, would tell us which drill to use uh, for a system that we have chosen, 
uh, what length of a drill that you're going to play or use uh, to uh, and how we're going to uh, sequence that and then uh, the right uh, instruments uh, to be used for the right uh, placement of implant maybe through the guide it also uh, allows you to see the amount of bone to implant contact that uh, you are likely to get based on the the cbcd, CBCD scan uh, in which you have placed these implants now that can give you an indication about what is the kind of bone to implant contact that you're going to have so that uh, you can make your decision about being able to load implant sooner uh, or, or later. Uh, the more the green that you have uh, on the, uh, on the uh, implant visible, uh, the better implant uh, uh, contact that you have with uh, medullary kind of a bone. So after the surgical plan is approved, uh, I would send the, uh, uh, the files to uh, uh, the laboratory to make a uh, to print a surgical guide in which uh, sleeves are placed which is which is going to allow us to uh, do a guided uh, surgical uh, shall we say protocol the lab is also then going to uh, print the temporaries and these temporaries are going to be uh, tied on to tie bases they're going to be bonded onto tie bases so that when we place implants through our surgical guide these temporaries are going to be uh, they're going to be able to deliver these on the same day at the same time as uh, surgical placement of implants provided our implants allow us to do that <clears throat> so we go into the surgery uh, extract teeth uh, go through the routine uh, shall we say steps of uh, uh, debridement of the sockets once that has been done the surgical guide uh, gets oriented uh, and then we are going to use the drilling protocol as uh, we had uh, and then place implants uh, one can do these uh, procedures flapless uh, or one may raise a small flap to be able to see uh, uh, things more clearly. When you go with a flapless approach, you're virtually going blind with respect to uh, bone and its relation with the implant. So after placement of all these implants is complete, uh, I could deliver this patient a temporary restoration, which was screw retained in one uh, single appointment in, in, in one single operative appointment this is a 24 hour follow-up uh, minimal flap meant minimal uh, pain swelling uh, and then this is now at about uh, three months post uh, placement of uh, implants and the temporaries uh, we treated the maxillary arch simultaneously we also worked on the remaining teeth to uh, improve their uh, health and prognosis and then we go on to the next step of uh, uncovering the maxillary implants, which are not loaded at the same time. The patient continued to wear a removable complete denture. So I uncover the implant. I make an impression of these implants at the same time. And I use uh, the patient's existing denture to, uh, uh, to make the jaw relation, jaw relation record and allow us to have orientation of uh, the dentition onto these implants. Uh, I could then convert this patient's maxillary uh, partial denture into a fixed prosthesis by the same protocol as we use for making a conversion prosthesis in an all-in-4 or all-in-5 kind of a protocol. Uh, with uh, that done and healing completed, I could make uh, custom abutments for the mandibular art, uh, for the mandibular and maxillary implants wherever required, and could execute cement retained fixed prosthesis for this patient's missing uh, uh, dentition and complete this uh, rehabilitation. Uh, an all on four or all on five protocol is a very popular one. Uh, it is uh, based on certain principles of biomechanically uh, st uh, st uh, stable implants, immediate load and immediate function for a fully or partially edentulous uh, patient. So we see an example of a similar one, similar case. This patient already came with a complete denture which was approved. This case uh, we treated in uh, the college where I conduct a full-time uh, program in implant dentistry. Uh, I'm sorry about this. All right, so uh, this, the protocol of doing a dual scan 
of uh, complete denture done with uh, fiducial markers, GP, GP points uh, uh, in this case. Uh, scan of a complete denture and scan of a complete denture in the mouth and just a complete denture with these markers outside is the way this protocol goes. So you can merge them accurately since you have a soft tissue between uh, the complete denture which is hard to see and guess on a CBCD scan. So uh, then we go ahead with uh, the implant studio and virtual planning and like you can see uh, in these different windows we have placed implants in the most uh, appropriate location uh, the distal implants being at an angle so implant planning is completed uh, we have made a surgical guide and we've designed this guide uh, uh, with the with the sleeves and then we are going to go and execute that with uh, with our with our surgical procedure the plan here was to place implants uh, the plan here was to do a pilot drill only uh, and then uh, go ahead and do a freehand uh, placement of uh, you know osteotomies and placement of uh, implants uh, done freehand. Uh, so here you go with uh, the surgical guide placed the osteotomy the first osteotomy is done uh, without a basic flap. Now as you can notice the location of uh, implant with respect to soft tissues is going to create some uh, soft tissue issues uh, going forward if you are to do a, a totally flapless uh, procedure uh, do punches in these soft tissues because you're going to have no attached uh, keratinized tissue on the lingual side so that was the reason why we had plans to uh, do a pilot guide drill only so at this stage we could uh, make uh, an incision and uh, the, the center picture shows uh, the location as per the plan with which we could make radiographs and confirm the location with respect to anatomic landmarks. Then uh, we would raise a conservative flap, uh, uh, correct the bone level to have the right platform and then complete our osteotomy uh, by doing a freehand guided by the first drill that we used to locate uh, to do the first osteotomy. As you can see, these implants are now located. Uh, the middle picture shows uh, measurements with ISQ and these measurements are high. So we are now going to place multi-unit abutments on. Uh, uh, we're going to modify the uh, bone levels with respect to implant platform so that the multi-unit abutment placement is not interfered with. And then we are going to go through the usual conventional protocol of making a conversion prosthesis. So the complete denture is uh, modified, uh, the uh, titanium sleeves are placed, uh, sutures in place, uh, a, a protective barrier is placed over the recently sutured tissues. And then we are going to attach these, uh, uh, this complete denture to these uh, titanium sleeves by uh, the conversion prosthesis uh, protocol. Once that acrylic sets, we're going to remove it, modify this complete denture into a conversion prosthesis and deliver this uh, immediately loaded uh, implant uh, prosthesis uh, on the same day as placement of implants, as you see in this case. Uh, so this was uh, a couple of days later, uh, and this was a case uh, done by uh, uh, one of my students, uh, Spandana at uh, the dental college uh, where I teach, which is Deva Patel Dental College in Pimpi. That, with that, we have seen a lot of uh, conventionally uh, done, conventionally known uh, implant uh, procedures using digital technologies. Uh, I'm going to go a little uh, uh, away from the so-called convention and look at something a little out of the box. Uh, so I get this patient who's, uh, who's a completely dentulous patient. He's had a stroke uh, uh, a couple of years ago and is barely able to wear his complete dentures uh, just because of the amount of uh, resorption that he's had being dentulous for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, being, uh, uh, having had a stroke is making his muscle coordination even poorer and he's really suffering on account of the fact that the denture does not retain and it cannot be stabilized. 
the average bone height that's available in the anterior mandible is only about four millimeters in places uh, it is even less than that so based on a from a 3d cbcd scan uh, we can uh, use that data to print a model of the bone which is what you see on uh, the screen right now so these are some of these are a couple of pictures of a bone model printed because our plan is now to make a custom implant if you look at the model carefully you can even see that the mandibular nerve is on the surface and mental forearm is, is virtually non-existent this mandibular nerve is, is is exposed out of bone that makes the patient's denture wear extremely painful as well when he tries to bite on that so this is definitely the amount of bone that's available in the anterior mandible is extremely little to be able to put any conventional implant and having a mandible that's as thin as that is going to keep this patient at risk of uh, a fracture uh, the surgeons uh, in our group would know what that means when you have an edentulous patient who has a fractured mandible extremely difficult uh, situation to treat so the plan is to make uh, uh, make a uh, custom implant uh, they used to be called as uh, subperiosteal implants uh, but uh, there is a very distinct defined protocol uh, if followed these implants with the way they are done as you will see in the sequence uh, in the sequence would eventually end up becoming endoscious because of the way we would raise a flap we would place this implant the way the implant is made and then the graft that's done over and above those so uh, that's a pattern on a refractory model uh, done by uh, Katara Dental uh, and that's an implant which has been now uh, cast out of a cast metal uh, the cast metal is a very specific one it's a it's a metal with with a very small amount of uh, uh, of uh, nickel and uh, molybdenum in it uh, and that allows this metal to be a surgical grade chrome cobalt uh, alloy uh, the surgical grade chrome cobalt alloys are used uh, extensively for different kinds of implants not just uh, in in the mouth but in or in orthopedic application as well the way this implant is designed is that most of this implant is on the external shall we say uh, contours of the mandible which is uh, dense cortical and is extremely stable uh, uh, the distal shoes of the implant here uh, go under the masseter muscle and uh, they engage the undercuts so the implant retains extremely well uh, when designed in this fashion so after the implant has been uh, cast uh, try try fitted you see uh, that the feet now uh, which are going to be under the tissue are sandblasted everything that's come going to come through the tissues is uh, polished extremely well uh, and then this implant now uh, the feet which are sandblasted are going to be uh, coated with a hydroxy appetite uh, 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 layer so on the right hand side you see the implant which is hydrox which is coated by hydroxy appetite this implant is then uh, uh, sterilized and is ready to be placed for this patient with a surgical procedure. The surgical procedure involves a, a large flap, exposure of the uh, um, lateral surface of the uh, ramus where the feet are going to be extended and uh, uh, once the uh, uh, exposure of the mandible is adequate, uh, the implant is then inserted and it fits and retains extremely well uh, onto this mandible. Now, this is not the end. This is where the actual process begins because now we are going to graft with uh, crystalline hydroxy appetite over the feet, which are already coated with hydroxy appetite, and cover these feet completely by crystalline hydroxy appetite before we achieve a complete watertight uh, closure uh, uh, by suturing the, 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 the incision and the flaps that we raised. When done by this protocol, when done by this method, 
uh, and when we achieve a good primary healing of this uh, case, we have an implant which is uh, sitting over uh, the mandible, over the cortex, uh, and has a graft material which is placed over the implant and around it. Uh, the implant is extremely stable because of the way it is designed. And uh, uh, because of this graft material and lack of mobility, it has been shown by histology studies by my dear friend in California, Dr. Doug Martin, that uh, uh, that bone actually grows from the surface of bone into the graft material over the implants. So an implant which was subperiosteal uh, over the bone, supraosseous, actually ends up becoming endosseous. He has histology done for four cases so far and he is waiting for the fifth one to be able to publish for it to be, then it is statistically significant that five consecutive cases consistently show that this subperiosteal uh, implant over a period of time becomes endosteal. You see follow up of this case now, this case is two years old. Uh, the critical part is that the patient maintains these uh, transmucosal uh, posts extremely well. These are highly polished and when maintained extremely well, we really have no worries uh, for this patient to have any issues going forward. Uh, Dr. Doug Martin, who's been my guru on this, uh, on this journey, uh, has cases which are almost 25 years old now. He has treated in excess of 350 cases with uh, the same protocol, uh, with not a single implant removed when it was done by this protocol. And as I said, he has histology of four, which shows bone that grows uh, into the implant and over the implant into the graft material. So this case is treated with uh, a bar and clip. And can you imagine the kind of retention and stability that this patient now has with her removal mandibular prosthesis and the way it has changed his life? Uh, I have a follow up of two years on this. And if you can notice uh, areas where the bone was uh, uh, bone exposed, the nerve has is going to have bone that covers uh, the uh, mandibular canal and exposed nerve, and is going to cover the implant, which is uh, HA coated as well. This is a clinical picture at uh, two years post operative, and to me, there possibly could not have been any other way of uh, treating this patient, which who had very little. Uh, or virtually no bone to be able to place implants by the conventional methods that we commonly treat our patients with. Uh, with this, I'm going to go on to a little bit of prosthetics because with digital implant, digital uh, technologies in implant dentistry, we can have extremely simplified prosthetics. I'm not going to dwell much on this because uh, just today afternoon, Katara Dental hosts uh, a Facebook Live on the same subject uh, with Ali talking on digital frontiers with implant prosthetics. So I'm not really going to, going to spend much time uh, doing this, but just show you a couple of cases. So here we have a mandibular incisor uh, fractured, uh, uh, which is going to be lost, in which uh, I place uh, an implant. Uh, once the implant has integrated, I'm going to use uh, scan bodies to be able to uh, capture the digital uh, impression of uh, this patient. These scan bodies can come in different sizes, shapes and variations from different systems. Uh, I prefer to use uh, the one that you see on, on the screen, which is made up of titanium. So there is no wear and tear and the fit and uh, accuracy is going to be extremely consistent. So an X-ray radiograph made with the scan body placed and then I'm going to make a scan. With the scan made, uh, the lab is now going to start working on uh, the prosthesis and a two units uh, screw retained prosthesis is a very simple uh, job for the laboratory to make, uh, which is stained zirconia bridge on a titanium hybrid base, a screw retained simple uh, prosthesis for uh, on, on a single uh, implant in the mandibular anterior region. One application of digital technologies is uh, is classic with uh, single piece implants. Uh, uh, this is a case with zirconia implants. Uh, zirconia implants are not extremely popular, 
but there is this population of patients who demand, who want something that's extremely bio compatible, uh, since there are some concerns about titanium uh, going into the body. And making physical impressions and getting accurate uh, fit uh, is not impossible, but can be a fair amount of challenge. So uh, for this indication, uh, I use uh, a digital scan, like a crown bridge uh, situation. And on this digital scan, the laboratory can uh, design for restoration and make uh, mill uh, monolithic uh, zirconium restoration. The scans can also allow us to uh, record a shade like you see on the left hand side. And the shade communication can be fairly accurate uh, is my experience with some of the systems that allow uh, a true color uh, light emitting through the, through the scanner. So uh, a, 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 a milled prosthesis, three splintered units on each side is fabricated by the lab, stained uh, monolithic zirconia restoration are delivered to this patient in easy two steps for this patient who had zirconia implants, uh, which was uh, by his uh, insistence and by choice. Uh, I'm going to uh, start concluding now. Uh, to summarize, digital technologies have absolutely revolutionized dental industry. These technologies are here, uh, technologies are here to stay. So uh, at the right time, take the plunge, uh, 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 embrace these technologies because they are really going to help you in, uh, in, in significant ways. They are going to shorten your treatment time. They're going to make your workflows effective. They're going to have uh, laboratory communication, which is of, a, of, of probably the best order. It would make uh, the process and treatment uh, execution profitable uh, when done to the right uh, scale, right mass. The outcomes are going to be far more predictable because there is no doubt and question about accuracy. And all this is for a total patient uh, satisfaction. Uh, uh, that concludes my presentation part. I thank you so much for uh, being a part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, Facebook Live. I'm going to change my screen and go on to uh, the Facebook page so that I can see some comments uh, and uh, questions if you may have. Uh, it looks like it's been a fairly uh, busy uh, morning with a lot of people uh, uh, having logged in. Uh, some you may type them in your uh, in your box. Uh, and then uh, probably answer them uh, uh, as they come. Clinically, how did you decide the cut for uh, the cut back? So that was by judgment, looking at the patient's speech, uh, looking at the amount of uh, display of uh, teeth. So that was uh, a pure clinical judgment. Now, this is not it because we are going to confirm that when the temporaries are made. So you have all the opportunities to change this vertical dimension uh, when the uh, temporary is delegated and the temporaries are delivered. So, so that time to confirm this. So that was a question by Priyanka Bansal. Uh, please do not reckon questions. Asha says, uh, in this FMR case, how do you increase uh, vertical dimension of occlusion without a face bow? We are just able to articulate How would the patient, uh, how patient is able to open the same amount uh, of bound for digital scan bite? All right. Now the patient has not opened the same amount. This is very interesting. Uh, with that word, with that jaw relation record made, when you record the byte with the scanner, the scanner and the software does not recognize your byte material. So the picture that you saw with the space between the two arches was a scan made with the pink colored wax in. So the patient is actually closing down on the wax. And that's the beauty of, uh, of, of uh, this technology, that it allows you to record uh, uh, make some records which are which are uh, not easy to make otherwise. Uh, 
uh, and they can be made fairly accurately. Samir, uh, the kit for this endoscious uh, implant was the BioRens kit. Now I really can't uh, relate the comments to the timeline since I saw I'm seeing the comments now. Uh, but thanks so much for uh, comments. Uh, Doctor Sanjay Damnar Zamdar asks, uh, "You don't seem to do deep programming before you start. Now, uh, is that your deep program? But haven't shown us." Now, yes, I haven't shown some steps. When I made that jaw relation record uh, with that pink wax in between, I was I had confirmed and I had uh, uh, I had recorded and, and confirmed that that was the central relation record uh, which was uh, reproducible. So this was done after deprogramming, if it was required. So uh, that's if it answers. Uh, that's uh, to, your, to your question. Uh, now, uh, Rakesh asks which software. I, I have a three shape scanner, so I use a three shape software with this. Over says uh, very nice presentation in the case of subperiostal bar one uh, done all on one go with bone granules graft. There's definitely going to be micro movement. So, what about effect uh, integration? All right. So, Vesh, uh, the answer to that is very simple. Uh, if you notice the design, the last two feet of the implant went over the external oblique ridge uh, onto the ramus. So, it engaged a significant amount of uh, undercut. If it is designed properly, uh, the implant retains extremely well. Now, my case, I did not do, I did not load immediately. But, uh, uh, but, the, but, but Doug Martin, from whom I have learned, he regularly, for all cases, he loads these implants immediately. So you, from that, you can imagine how retentive this implant would be when it engages uh, bilaterally, uh, uh, bilaterally the uh, area of uh, ascending ramus beyond external oblique ridges. I hope this answers your question. I answered the on the FMR cases. Uh, do metal ceramic implant prosthesis can be done with digital protocol? The answer is yes, but you don't really have uh, the full benefit if you use uh, casting as a method to make uh, uh, post metal framework. Uh, you can design uh, the uh, the restoration. You can cut back on it, and that can be made. Uh, one can also do uh, 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 printing of metal. Uh, the third way by which you could employ uh, digital technologies to you do porcelain fused to metal is to print uh, or mill a wax pattern, which can now then be cast. So there are several ways by which you can make porcelain by metal based prosthesis by digital technologies. Do you know something? Laboratory, uh, laboratories uh, have been using digital technologies for manufacturing uh, prosthesis for a long time. Uh, it's taken us clinicians a lot more time to embrace these technologies. Uh, and the reason was that uh, the intraoral scanners and that technology has taken time to catch up. When, uh, uh, when to my knowledge, with uh, Procera, which was by uh, Noble Biocare and Lava, uh, by the time those systems were available, available, uh, the labs had already embraced uh, digital processes for manufacturing restorations a long time ago. So they've been doing this for 10 years. Our interface with them has gone digital in this uh, recent past now. So. Uh, Dr. Amit Gupta has a question. I was told not to use retraction cord. Now that we can also, and also can we have GR with digital scan? Of course, yes. And I, I did mention about that. Uh, 
Uh, Amit Sadwani says, uh, if you are wrong with surgical guide driven placement, even uh, by a fraction of millimeter, the remade prosthesis may not confirm to the placement. Yes, you are right. I saw the prosthesis with non-engaging amendments made by you in the lecture. How do you deal with such situations? Now, uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't like to go flapless and blind more often than not. Uh, if you notice that your implant location has not been exact as per, one can always uh, reline uh, or, or reattach the uh, the titanium sleeves to a to the prosthesis which has been made, uh, uh, which can get you out of a catchy situation. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Tarun Kumar says, uh, uh, your opinion on 3D printed subparacel implants. Uh, uh, I'm sure that's something that's possible. I have not done that. But I understand one thing for sure is that cast chrome cobalt is going to offer you the kind of strength that nothing else is going to. There is this uh, misconcept that uh, titanium is the only or rather only commonly used metal that can be placed inside our body and is biocompatible and that's not correct chrome cobalt surgical grade is as biocompatible as uh, as titanium is or titanium alloys are uh, however the titanium alloy titanium and titanium alloys including the grade 5 are almost one third in strength compared to chrome cobalt alloy so when you want to make a lean neat uh, you know implant with uh, the uh, mu per mucosal uh, studs which are small round polished uh, you should be employing a metal or a material which is extremely strong and in my opinion and from what i hear uh, is uh, what uh, chrome cobalt fulfills all those uh, criteria so i guess uh, uh, i guess one can use different ways different uh, different materials uh, Casting is something that, uh, you know, is what I used because that's what I learned. I'm sure it would be worth looking at. Yes, uh, Amit Narang says, wouldn't mandibular flexion play a role? Yes, the very fact that uh, the implant could go over the uh, external oblique ridges uh, and engage those undercuts means that the implant has flexibility. Uh, one very important uh, factor is what, is, is what I understand in making these implants is not to make them too bulky and robust so that they maintain the same flexion as the mandible does. I hope that answers your question. I tried to do a digital full, full mouth implant case with MUA placed but I got error during JIP trial. I used internal scan bodies for the same. What is your uh, call on uh, multi unit abutment digital scan bodies? Now, Parth, uh, I must confess that uh, uh, I have restricted my implant prosthetics with, uh, with, with uh, scan bodies to one to two units. I have not tried full arch cases with, uh, with, with uh, digital, making digital impressions. Uh, it's just that because there's not uh, ample, shall we say, uh, literature that supports the accuracy of uh, digital scan. Uh, I may not be updated on this uh, matter, uh, but I, I think uh, the consensus still are that uh, uh, it's still still a little distance away before we can make a full digital protocol for prosthetics or for large cases. I hope that answers home in this case as well. Uh, Rakesh Shah asks, uh, is it necessary to stabilize? Uh, if your implant is designed well, uh, you don't need to, but I have seen some uh, people use retention screws uh, for uh, such implants. Uh, Ashish Mahan says, I've tried full case, uh, full arch case with CBCT compromise, computerized surgical guide, flapless approach, but clinical osteotomy was with bone soft tissue, thought it would be because CBCT immediately anterior process was planned. Can you elaborate on such? I showed you a case uh, which was on the same. Uh, uh, 
uh, from white deer with a failed peak material, lots of decoration, pink and white. I feel this is a failure of veneering. Also feel new things are always learning curve and understanding. And that's exactly the reason why I would say that uh, anything new should be treated with caution. There are places to try them. Uh, my patient pays me his top dollar, his top, you know, his hard earned money. And I'm not here to experiment uh, with new materials on my patients. Some people choose to do that. Uh, it's their call. Uh, I would rather use that uh, in an experimental setting, uh, gather experience and information on uh, such new materials, and then use that in clinical situations when they prove that they have a significant benefit over the conventional methods that we've been using. Porcelain fused to metal is more than 40 years old now. It probably is 50 years old. And consistently, you see such spectacular results. Uh, not uh, immediate post-insertion, but with follow-ups which are 10 and 15 years old. Uh, we've got too used to seeing cases immediate insertion. Most of the stuff that you see on uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Instagram is what was done probably an hour ago. Uh, we'd like to see these cases uh, one year and five year and ten year out. And I showed you several of those cases, uh, you know, several years in. So I would like to see uh, these new materials used uh, for a long period of time with a lot of uh, follow up before I could employ them. I'm not going to have my, I'm not going to have my patients become guinea pigs of uh, my experimentation, shall we say, whims. Without, uh, with all the humility I say Vikram, comment about a particular material or a technology or a particular way of doing things. It's just my my personal take. <clears throat> Abhishek Mistri, please send me a message privately. I'll send you a lecture uh, by Doug Martin. Doug Martin, we invited for an ISOI conference in 2011. He gave a spectacular lecture. I have a recording of that. Very few people actually understood what he was saying. Uh, when you listen to his lecture, I'll share that. Maybe uh, with uh, Doug's consent, I'll put it on YouTube so everybody can have a look at that. When you listen to the lecture once, and not, not just once, but twice and thrice, you'll understand the amount of thought and experience that has gone into uh, this style of doing implants. So uh, uh, listen to that. I will share that with you. Srinivas, uh, thank you so much for your compliments. Uh, uh, titanium coated uh, cast implants for superior still. Have you tried? No, I have not tried uh, titanium implants. As I, I mentioned that they are not uh, strong enough. Uh, Arun Batra says, sir, is it possible doing extraction in software and plan surgical guide? Yes, I showed your case with, uh, with, with that. Uh, uh, virtual extraction, virtual designing of uh, restoration, and then surgical guide. Then the lab can also print you the temporaries. Should superior still be uh, used instead of uh, so-called basal? <laughs> I'm not going there, Rumi. <laughs> superior, have you used axilla? No, I'm not used. I just have got uh, you know very limited experience with that. But uh, I've seen a lot of cases, and I've seen fewer maxillary cases than mandibular cases. You know, as a prosthodontist, I can tell you that it's, that it's easy to make a complete denture in maxilla with which patients are happy. It is not so easy, or rather it is very difficult to make a mandibular complete denture without aid of some, 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 some implants or some other aids like, uh, like implants. So uh, maxilla is uh, one that requires uh, uh, for a removable prosthesis aids less often than mandibular mandible does. I'm also told that uh, max maxilla has more failures, but I have no experience on that. Sudhindra asks, uh, any uh, need for fixation screws? And I think I answered uh, uh, that question, Sudhindra. 
Uh, I don't see any more questions coming. So uh, if everybody is good, we can uh, sign off. Uh, I must uh, say uh, thanks uh, a lot, uh, everyone, for for. It is always better to join implant cross arch with proper weight for three time, three um, months or so. Yes, I agree with you know, Srinivas. So if uh, if it's all okay, uh, Dr. Uday Shetty, are you uh, still logged in? Maybe you could sign off uh, this Facebook Live program and. Uh, our own places. Thanks a lot for your all your compliments. I am really humbled uh, by the amount of participation. Uh, it was a very very short notice, less than twenty four hours, and I see that we had uh, a significant uh, attendance. Uh, I'm sure this uh, this will be uh, available uh, on Facebook uh, page of ISOI Implant Study Forum forever. Uh, for those who wish to uh, watch uh, maybe a part of the whole thing uh, in the future. <clears throat> so much. So here with this, I sign off. Uh, I end this uh, live video. Thank you so much once again, everybody, for being a part of this program. I really appreciate uh, uh, being here uh, and uh, and you know being a part of this program. Thank you. Stay safe. Uh, be home. Uh, I'm sure it's not going to be long before uh, the present almost a calamity ends, uh, and we need to uh, behave responsibly in a manner that we are able to do as our doctors, our medical fraternity, and government uh, wishes us to. Thank you so much. Bye bye.